All right, all right, all right. Welcome to another edition of Shabbat Lounge. This is Matt and... And Jake here. And today, we're, we're going to talk to you about what? Torah. We're talking Torah. Talking Torah. Yeah. Talking Torah with Sabbath Lounge, and we appreciate you being here. And we'd appreciate if you'd subscribe. There is literally a button here. I think I've said that before, and there's never a thing. But yeah. Now there is oh, actually a button. we got to put it, we got to point this way, because we're, we're there. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you're getting <laughs> spatial patterns. Yeah, you, yeah, you got to use your... Mirrored vision. Mirrored vision. So we're going to talk about um, Shemot it. Shemot. Names. Names. Yeah. Week so, 13. What do you think it's called names? I think they uh, bring up a bunch of names of people, like right off the bat mm -hmm. in this Torah portion. Right? Yeah. So this is the uh, our overview of week 13. High end look at some things that maybe we picked out, maybe we learned, maybe you could learn from mm -hmm. uh, from this Torah portion, Exodus chapter one, just starting through chapter six, verse one. You could say the thousand foot view. Yes, if you wanted to be cliche, and we don't, so we won't say that. We won't say that. We won't say. But Forget I said that. This is a thousand foot view here. Yes. So we're going to go take a look at this. Remember, we're just trying to glance over it, and we want you to go back and read it if you haven't read it. That's kind of the point. We're not reading it for you. All right, so one of the first things we're going to look at is... Um, Here, read this for the people. Read this. Okay. <laughs> Genesis fifteen eighteen. On that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. What's the river of Egypt? And so we talked about that and we looked at, we did some research and, we, and so we looked at the Nile River and the Nile is, is it the longest river? Uh, that's what they tell is me. Is it the Amazon? Mm, I mean, I haven't gotten my measuring stick <laughs> out, so. <laughs> so it's definitely up there for sure. And it probably yeah. depends on how you count them. We figured that out. It depends on how you want to measure the Nile because it has some tributaries, just like here in Texas. The Red River has a, the Pease River runs into it. And, uh, and you don't want to eat fish out of that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Red River is a tributary to the Mississippi. And, uh, but the Nile has some tributaries, and one of the tributaries is the White Nile, but it was also called something else somewhere. What was Victoria it? Victoria Nile. It comes out of Lake Victoria in Africa and runs north which, you know, not as many rivers run north. Right. In my experience. south is down mm -hmm. on the map, so. <laughs> yes, that's right. But for sure it's true in Texas, like all the rivers in Texas run south except for a handful. Are there actual rivers in Texas? Mm, that's hurtful. Are they all man-made? That's hurtful, Jake. <laughs> there oh, are. that's, that's, that's you just, lakes or ponds. Or no, there are real real rivers you just have to go down like austin san antonio and you'll see okay. rivers okay but we don't have any in, <laughs> not many in the north texas area but anyway so it, it's just interesting that the we, we all think of the little red sliver there don't we yes the promised land that, i mean that's that's all we're thinking about and what do you think that is what do you think that that is i think it's because that's where it is now kind of well, and don't you think that it always was the choice land? Yeah, I think that's like the breadbasket. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was the desirable. I mean, that's the expense of real estate. I mean, you think about it, you know, how much uh, do you think, you know, if I can take my cursor, if you can see that, you know, what's land price out here in this desert versus land price right up here on the coast? I haven't been checking that lately. <laughs> yeah, but neither. Go to Zillow and check that out. Yeah. If you got an address down there, I'm sure you could find out. Yeah, probably not. There's probably some huts there. Maybe. But I would imagine the land here in the desert is really cheap yeah. versus a uh, Mediterranean coastal community. So we're telling you, go buy land there now Oh, in good preparation. Idea. Good idea. And you'll be the first in line. <laughs> yes, first in line. But it is interesting just to think about that technically, so we're going to talk about Midian and we're going to talk about Jethro and the land of Goshen and kind of, um, uh, you know, where some of these things are. And technically everything over here by the Nile was already in the promised land. Yeah. 
So Matt, why don't you tell us why the border drawn here has this insanely it's, straight line? It's kind of like a bell or something. Yeah. Um, yes, we, we thought that was weird. So we started going, well, why is that? I don't think that would be like that. And so because the definition here says Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the Euphrates, Euphrates currently runs, you know, through Iraq here and ends up at, that's the, the Gulf, uh, the hot, hotly contested Persian Gulf, that is. And so, you know, we talked about how in the United States, the Mississippi River, at the mouth of the river there in Louisiana, uh, we don't say the Mississippi continues to run through the Gulf. Right. And then it depends on where you draw the Nile over over there. Can I exit that? What happens if I exit that? Nope, I don't no, want to do that. Don't do that. I don't go so, away. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah, it comes down to the where the Nile starts. The official Nile. Yeah. And so it says in the verse, all the land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the Euphrates. So all the land in between there. So a lot of people will draw this line from the you know, straight line from the Nile to the Euphrates. But we've also seen maps that take this whole area of Saudi Arabia and Oman and Yemen, and they include all that as part of the land. And some of this stuff here in Egypt or in uh, Africa. Yeah, they take it all the way to the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is interesting to, uh, we don't often think about the Saudi Arabia connection much. And we also don't think and talk about the Africa connection, you know, very much. But, I mean, they're in Africa, Yeah. you know. Um, we think of it, I think sometimes me and more European, but, um, definitely it, it, you know, Africa is right there. Yep. So anyway, That's study right. that out, see what you think about, uh, the original land grant versus what we see today. But, but people get all in a knot today about this piece of land and people talk about the temple and the red heifer and they can get so bent out of shape. And um, I think they are missing the point. Yes, there is a modern country named Israel, but it is not the Israel that you and I belong to. Right. Not necessarily. It's not the same. Necessarily correct. the same thing. Exactly. Name's the same. Name's the same. All right. So let's talk about Moses. Moses moves to Midian. And uh, so there's some scriptures there. And so, you know, why Midian? Who's in Midian? There's this guy named uh, Jethro down there. That's right. So Jethro. I think he played the flute, right? Jethro played the flute. Jethro uh, Tull. Oh, <laughs> Jethro Tull. Very good. Jamming on that flute. Man. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Yes. So, um, so you've got the identification of the land of Goshen, which is, you know, kind of over here. Um, and choice land. Yep, choice land in, in Egypt. And um, so it shows you that in, in a lot of ways, Moses' journey parallels the journey that he takes people on. So, I mean, I don't think there's any coincidence that Moses goes and spends time in the desert. Um, right around Mount Sinai. <laughs> And then has to send a bunch of people over there. So, you know, he knew the he was a good guide. He knew the land. It wasn't like he was going in here blind. Right. And lost wandering the desert mm -hmm. for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he probably knew where he was the whole time. Yeah. Which which is a good point. Which would probably be frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> More frustrating to him. So we want to go into... Right that's right. <laughs> go into a little bit more detail of... Um, Jethro and Moses' relations. And, and then I actually, as I'm reading this, Havilah, isn't that the land where there was gold? I think I've read that before. Maybe in Genesis it says that. You should go look that up. Okay, so in the King James Bible, so how do we get to this guy Jethro? Well, Chronicles, Chronicles, Chronicles things. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and would you read First Chronicles one twenty two? Now the sons of Keturah, Abraham's concubine, she bears Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua and the sons of Jokshan, Sheba and Dedan. All right, so who is this Keturah lady spoken of here? This is Abraham's concubine. Yes, uh, some people say. A third say, wife of Abraham. Yeah, some people just say wife after, isn't it after Sarah has died? Yes. And so after Sarah dies, he marries this other lady and they have children, you know. Abraham is old, but still having children. 
So, and one she of these. She must not have been that old. Maybe, maybe. not. Maybe <laughs> not. And uh, one of these. Not necessarily. Yes, could but. have been old. One of these is Midian. Yes. And so, because we are talking about really old ancient people, you know, sometimes uh, you get things named after you. Yeah. And especially um, if you're Midian, you get a whole area named after you. And so that is the land of Midian. And so this is a, ti a timeline, what is this family tree, showing you you had Abraham and Sarah, she dies, and then you have Abraham, Hagar, you get the Ishmaelites, and then you have the line of Keturah, and Midian is there, and then eventually you come down and you find Jethro, and Jethro becomes the father-in-law of Mo Moses, has a daughter named Zephora. Yes, I just think it's interesting You see this family tree from Midian to Jethro. Not a lot of branches on there, Matt. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Not too complicated. <laughs> but also, we, there's just a lot there we don't know. Yes. Yeah, or, or it's lost to history, or, or it hasn't been found yet. Right. So... But um, but it doesn't make the story not true to me for sure, just because right. I don't know all the missing pieces there. But but that kind of explains um, who this is. And so I think what you see here is you also go okay. So where did the what tribe did the priests come from? Well, of course they come from Levi or Levi. And so you definitely have this Levi priesthood. And what do you know? Moses is a Levi. He is a Levi. And what did it say about Levi's later on in the Torah? Moses wrote that Levi's, who, who could they marry? They could marry uh, of the priestly family. That's right. And so Moses does that. And so, you know, there was a time when I read through some of this and I was like, this guy, you know, when, when I, okay, so all of you, <laughs> all of you probably have gone down this path where everything's pagan. You know, like you yeah. pick up a rock and you're like, oh, that's pagan. You know, everything is pagan. And so when I saw well, that... pet rocks are pagan. Yes, <laughs> pet rocks. What about a rock concert? You know, rocks glued on a piece of board and it says rock concert. Oh, that's really old. Super pagan. <laughs> so anyway, um, Jethro... Yeah, they, so when they say Jethro is was a, a priest, priest, we automatically go, oh, pagan priest. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. I bet that guy was pagan. He probably did idols. Yeah. And <laughs> that's not necessary. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. Um, uh, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense that he was a legitimate priest, but he wasn't the Aaronic priesthood. He wasn't out of that lineage. He's more of like the Melchizedek priest line. And so that makes a lot of sense that Moses would have married uh, another, you know, someone in the priest lineage. So then you might say that... Uh... Nah, you might not. Never okay. mind. I'm not going to follow up on that. So anyway, I think it's 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 worth studying up and reaching your own conclusion on. And so, you know, who is Jethro? So Jethro was a Midianite. What's a Midianite? Someone from Midian. One of the uh, sons of Midian. And they were considered nomadic tribe people yeah. living in the desert. And so, you know... Did they live in Egypt? Um, I mean, I'm sure their paths went around the area. They they weren't in Egypt proper, as you might say. Right. <clears throat> and so, you know, it says they were metalsmiths. You know, I got this all from Britannica or someplace like that. But, but Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. He's a Kenite. Um, and a priest leader, which is the Kenites are important later, um, which is kind of interesting. But um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of things here um, to, uh, you know, to track down. If you've never looked at the Kenites, if you've never looked at the Melchizedek priest line, those are all things you should consider here. And um, but anyway, it's yeah, it I think the understanding here is interesting how they say, you know, he was the priest leader of the tribe that he led in the worship of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, yeah, and that's the Britannica people saying that. So, you know, uh, I do think it's worthy to consider that it makes sense that he was a legitimate priest and he knew 
Torah. And he, he, you know, this is before Torah, but he knew, he knew uh, the father. He had a relationship. Yeah. He's not just some rando that Moses runs into and befriends and Moses, right. he feels sorry for Moses. And, and if he wasn't, if he was some pagan priest, he's, he's giving Moses later on, as you'll mm-hmm. see, as we keep up with the potions, uh, that he's giving Moses uh, advice on how to run the Israelite camp. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, Yahweh really deals well with that kind of thing if it's from like a pagan root. Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of is a feather in Jethro's cap. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely doesn't fit. So anyway, so another interesting thing about Jethro and, and you know, as we talked about it, so Jake, what what did we say? What was our theory behind why does Jethro end up kind of close to Egypt? Well, um, that would be kind of a, a place where he could be, you know, on his own. He's like homesteading on, on in the, you know, in the rural areas. Yeah. And he's, uh, but he can run into town if he needs to build up his supplies. Yeah. And it kind of makes sense that they, they probably did that. Do you think he was affected by the famine that we read about in Joseph? Is that a possibility? Uh, well, that would be 400 and some years prior, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, I'm sure his family lineage was, and you know, being nomadic, probably went into town in Egypt, and mm-hmm. you know, this was a place that the Midianites could establish themselves, but still make it into Egypt to get that grain. Get yeah. that grain. Yeah, it's like a suburb. He commuted. Yeah, but. But I do think it's important to look at, you know, he never technically sold out to the Egyptians. And so, you know, we, we right now, a lot of us are thinking we're in Egypt, which I believe is absolutely correct. We're in Egypt and uh, we are going to be let out in the second exodus. And, you know, there's something, a greater exodus coming. But Jethro, he didn't have to have an exodus. Technically, he was already living in, quote unquote, the promised land, and he wasn't in bondage and he wasn't in slavery. And he doesn't go with them when they yeah. when they leave. He just, OK, I'm going back home. Yeah. And it's kind of weird. It's like, well, why wouldn't he want to be a part of the group? But he was it, a I different think, place. I think it's because we have a narrow view of what the promised land was. Exactly. We have a narrow view. Exactly. And and um, it's it's. It's more sometimes more than a physical place. I think it's it's where you are spiritually, and I think Jethro shows he's in a different place spiritually. He doesn't have to go through all the stuff that they went through. He doesn't have to burn the Egypt out of it. Yeah, he wasn't doing that, and so he didn't have to wander around in the desert. Uh, you know, he he probably picked what he what he wanted to do. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, this Jethro, he's an interesting character, and and you know, we th- talk a lot about crying out and being let out. But I'm the, the more I kind of study this, the more I'm like, maybe I should be more like Jethro. How do I get like that? Where I am not having to sell out to the mammon and the money of the world and um, kind of. Yeah. We're kind of person. playing both parts of that because, you know, every one of us has Egypt inside of us that we need to come out of. Mm-hmm. But like in reality, like in, like in the, in the physical, we don't want to be engulfed by Egypt also. So, right. so it's how do you stay separate from the beginning yet we're already not separate from the beginning. It's kind of a, kind of both sides of it there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we're just putting some things for you to think about and not that we are claiming to be experts or have it all figured out. And we, we don't have, you a, couldn't tell. <laughs> and we don't have, we don't have a tremendous amount of information about Jethro to say much. You know, there's just not a lot there. Numbers 12 tells us a little bit more about the lady that he marries. Um, and so tell us about her. All right. And Miriam and Aaron, a. Aaron, spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So who's the he here? He is the Yitro, Jethro. Right? 
Oh, no, Moses. I believe it's I'm Moses. A, I'm a yeah. goof. Uh, no, yes, it's so, Moses. So I think it's course. kind of interesting, which just shows that Jethro and his family, they moved around and maybe at the time, you know, she did live, you know, they lived in Ethiopia for a while, but, you mm -hmm. know, they may have lived all over. They may have ended up in the promised land. Yeah, some and point. Ethiopia they're, they're isn't true. really all that far from, no. from Midian. Uh -oh. So maybe yeah. he ran into town and got himself a wife at mm -hmm. the well, like like they do. With the watering hole. People still do that, I think. Different kind of watering hole, though. Yeah. Uh, Genesis 15, 14 through 16 in the King James. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great sus substance. And thou shalt go f to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Has this been fulfilled? E e yes, it has. Well, yeah. it's like all prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. It was fulfilled, it is being fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled kind of situation. Because yeah. we have Amorites among us that mm -hmm. we are trying to, you know, uh, not fall into line with. Um, so, yeah, so here we're saying the fourth generation is how long they were in Egypt. Yeah, right? and, and you and I, I think, look at that different. In, in, in America today, fourth generation, we don't think hundreds of years, do we? No. Because you might have four generations in your family if you have a great-grandparent. Right. And you have, you know, grandchildren there. And, you know, you could say, well, that's that's not that long. But right. I, and, and I think people get confused in this scripture, and I have before too, and not understood that this is a long time. Yeah. And so we're going to prove that to you. Right. And I think interesting here, oh. if we go back there, is the, uh, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Remember when they came out of Egypt, it was a, you know, the army of Yahweh coming out of Egypt. And it was as a, as a rod of smiting and judgment on pagan nations also. It mm -hmm. wasn't just salvation for the Israelites. It was yeah. that too. But it was also... Uh, a judgment for other nations. Mm -hmm. And this is a timeline um, just kind of showing you uh, where Moses comes from and Jethro and, you know, it didn't really explain the Jethro timeline. He just kind of pops out of nowhere there, but. Oh, almost like Melchizedek did. Yes. It just kind of yes. popped out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so then Exodus 1240. The length of time that the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430th year to the very day, all the ranks of Yahweh departed from the land of Egypt. All right, so 430, so that four generations becomes 430. Right. Why? It's because of this. They lived a long time. Yes. So this one kind of just somebody did the math and just kind of shows the ages and timelines of the people and that's how you get to 430. Correct. So just another proof that uh, the word is true. Right. And also, before that, um, before the uh, four generations, it mm -hmm. also says 430 years mm -hmm. in, as mm -hmm. part of the prophecy. But it's before, uh, it's, well, it's actually right around the time of the, mm -hmm. the four generations mm -hmm. that he talks about. And then Moses is the grandson of Levi, or Levi, and so you know that that we've seen that. That's not hard to uh, research there. But Jasser, you know the 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 uh, book of Jasser um, says that Moses had a Levi. You know specifically says that um, now. See, I think that I don't think I meant to say Levi priest, but his priest, his father is a priest, but uh, also father from Levi. Mm. So. Uh, Moses gets the girl by pulling the staff out of the, the staff out of a rock, like the sword and the stone. That's the legend that, in the, that you see in the Book of Jasser, where um, it was the same the, the the rod and staff that he uses to part the Red Sea. He had really got that from it was a staff that Adam and Noah had carried, and the forefathers, and eventually someone, the the last person to have it, sticks it in the ground, and everyone 
tried to pull it out of the ground. It became like this thing. Nobody could pull it out of the ground. Moses comes up one day. He's like, oh, this thing? Roop! And it comes right up out of the ground. And They all loosened it. <laughs> yes. And then Jethro's like, hey, um, you're the chosen one. Marry my daughter. So, you know, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. But that is what Jasser says, you know. And um, so I just think it's inter worth mentioning uh, a little bit of that possible backstory. But it also, sometimes you see these stories where, you know, it doesn't take hard. To, it's not hard to see that the sword and the stone and other legends probably, you know, may, may have come out of something true mm -hmm. that, I, that could have actually happened. So, tell us about Moses. Uh, Moses was a kind lad. No. Um, so, he spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd, 40 years as a leader. So, uh, this is just breaking up his, his timeline. You know, he's about 40 when he smites the Egyptian. And then uh, he's 80 when he leaves mm -hmm. to go uh, when they leave Egypt uh, and head into the wilderness. And then, you know, he's continues in the wilderness for 40 years. So. Yeah, that's a, and that's a long time, 40, yeah. 40, 40. A lot of people would think they were done, you know, a lot, well, the midlife crisis. Many people at about 40 start going, well, I guess my life's half over. Yep. You know, um, Moses was a third over. You know, yep. he was still going strong. So, you know, uh, d I think it's important for one thing to look at Moses' life and realize that you can still be used at any point in your life. Yeah. Uh, you can be old and he and you can still be used. Yeah. So. And I've heard uh, it kind of explained in this way, like, you know, he spent 40 years in Egypt and it took 40 years to get the Egypt out of him. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, now he's taking 40 years to get the Egypt out of others. He's leading others, you know, mm, yeah. in the direction that he, he took also. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it helps understand why he's humble. Yeah. You know, cause he went from being, you know, practically king of the world to nobody. Yeah. You know, uh, pounding sand in the desert, you know, every yeah. day. And, uh, that, that'll do something to you. Yeah. And it took a while. And also shows that, you know, this journey we're on, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. You know, this is a, a you know, changing slowly over time. It's kind of almost like the new wineskins things. If you did it too quickly, the wineskins would burst. Right. Oh, you're, you're on something. Okay. Oh, is that it? And that's all we know about okay. uh, uh, Shemote. Yep. That's all Shemote. That's all Shemote. Oh, that's right. So, um, the, this picture reminds me that, uh, we should mention the burning bush cause that happens right mm -hmm. in this, in this section. Uh, so the burning bush is a thorn bush, right? It goes with the, um, uh, the thorns from the wilderness or from when they leave the garden and that's the curse on, on the land is, and on man is that they'll work through the thorns to, to make their harvest and to eat up from the land. And, uh, uh, the thorn bush that is the Ark of the, of the covenant, you know, wrapped in gold. So this is tied with, uh, sin, right? It's, and the it's, ram caught in the thicket. The ram caught in the thicket. That's it's probably thorns. It's a thorn bush. And then the crown of thorns on Yeshua's head. It's all, it's all tied up in, in, uh, representation of sin and this uh, burning bush is like Yahweh can live with us, but he would burn our thorny nature. And just as he comes to dwell in us, he, he burns us, but he doesn't consume us. Uh, so in the bush still looks like a bush at the end. Yeah. And yep. he doesn't completely, he still allows us to be who we are. Yeah. Which is pretty fascinating. But you have to go through the fire. Yeah. To be purified. And uh, so I think that's interesting. If you think about it that way. That, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is interesting too because we also know, you know, there's a lot of references to the potter and clay and being refined and turned into something new, and and that that will happen. But uh, but the burning bush also kind of shows that, you, that its identity got preserved even though it got cleansed. Yeah. But anyway, that's good. All right, anything else we want to say about Shemot? I mean, that's all I got right now. All right. Well, bottom line is, we won't, you know, read this stuff. Read your Bible. Read the Torah portion. Find a group of believers to do this with, even if it's your own family, even if it's a neighbor. You know, uh, it's not hard to uh, to find people that you can fellowship with and and host them for a dinner and and read the scripture together. Just have a Bible study. So yeah. That's basically. It's very simple. Don't make this complicated. Yep. And uh, read your portion. Read the, yep. read the Bible and uh, uh, try to pick out some stuff that that uh, strikes you. See what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's talking to you about. That's right. Well, we hope this has been meaningful and useful to you. And please share it with others. And um, this is Matt and Jake signing off. <laughs>